Um, well, first of all, I'd just like to really thank uh, Matt Kaushler and the rest of the Chiasm uh, crew for inviting me along to speak with you tonight. It's a real pleasure to be here. And just before I start, um, how many people in the room are scientists or training to be scientists? Okay, good. Minister Noe, that's a good response in the engineer thing. But, yeah. um, <laughs> I'll put my hand up as well. Um, I kind of dress in sort of more business attire these days, and um, I no longer work in the research lab. Um, but I'm still a scientist, and the reason I say that is I still use my scientific training and that sort of approach to the world in everything that I do and in the work that I do. So my journey started right here at the University of Auckland. I'm very proud to be an alumnus of uh, Auckland. Uh, so I um, did my undergraduate in pharmacology, chemistry and biology, um, before I um, dropped off overseas to do a PhD uh, in Cambridge uh, in chemistry, which I absolutely loved. And for those of you who like to spot chemistry, there's a bit of a snapshot from my thesis, um, where I was doing a total synthesis of natural products from the marine environment with interesting anti-cancer properties. Um, so as a lot of us sort of do as we get towards the end of our kind of, you know, PhDs and we're thinking about what to do next, there's that kind of question about, um, you know, I really kind of love my science, I really enjoy what I'm doing, but what's the next pathway for me? And for me at that time, it was really about thinking about how I could leverage my kind of um, knowledge and expertise to help translate science out into the real world, um, so to have a, a broader benefit for society. And uh, that's where I, um, I, my calling was into uh, the Royal Society of Chemistry in the UK, where I was uh, managing international programs of support for the chemistry community, um, but with a real focus on um, looking at how we can leverage our global networks um, within chemistry and chemical sciences uh, to tackle um, global challenges. Um, and there's, there's plenty of global challenges out there, right? And um, that's not even with putting Donald Trump into the mix, you know, so that's a different story. Um, but just to give you some examples, um, about 3.4 billion people in the world, that's about half of the population of the, of the planet, are thought to be at risk of malaria. Every year in Europe, 25,000 people die of uh, drug-resistant infections, and that's the same number of people that died from road accidents. In 1960, one hectare of land was enough to feed two people. In 2050, we reckon we're going to need, uh, that, that same area of land is going to need to uh, feed six people. And every minute around the globe, uh, three children uh, die from water-related uh, illnesses. So that just gives you a bit of a flavour, and that's really not even getting into the whole kind of complexities that climate change throws into the mix, right? And so I'm sure that most people in this auditorium, I certainly hope so, would agree with me when I say that the solutions to these challenges are really going to come from cutting-edge science and innovation. That lies at the heart. And a lot of that is going to originate in some of our cutting-edge kind of labs um, around the world and the research that's going on. But one of the things that I've come to realise over the years, one of the key challenges, is actually if we're really going to create meaningful solutions to these challenges um, that are workable across society and we can actually roll them out and implement them, we actually need scientists working beyond the lab and actually across the whole spectrum of society. So we need people like yourselves um, working in industry, in business, in the public sector, in government, and in our education system and beyond. Um, because not only do we have to kind of take that science and translate it into new technology, products and services, but we also have to make sure that we're bringing society on the journey with us as we're sort of introducing kind of new innovations that might actually in some way, in some, some instances, come up against what we kind of believe or what we've, we're comfortable with. So there's a real role uh, for scientists across the whole spectrum to work in a range of different fields, and it's really important that we do so to be able to make sure that we're kind of leveraging our science to be able to do the best as possible in the world. And so at this point, it was looking from afar, was what motivated me to, um, to come back to New Zealand. Um, and for all of the reasons that Minister Joyce pointed out earlier, um, that you know, really seeing a, an increase in investment um, that was going into our, our science and innovation system in New Zealand, but as well as all of the amazing new kind of high-tech um, sectors uh, and clever companies that are kind of merging across the system, but also really motivated by a real strong belief in what we have in New Zealand and the power of our science, our know-how, and particularly our innovative spirit to really, you know, become a world-leading force 
and actually not only creating the solutions, to the technology solutions to some of the challenges I talked about, but actually driving um, you know, our knowledge economy so that we can diversify our economy and create growth in, in this country. And that's kind of what um, we're now doing at KiwiNet. Um, so at KiwiNet, um, and working as part of the Commercialisation Partner Network, we're really helping to kind of translate really clever science that's coming out of our universities and Crown Research Institutes and get it out into the real world. So to create those new kind of products, services and clever companies that are going to form the basis of a knowledge-based economy in New Zealand, not only for creating kind of new solutions to global challenges, but also for driving economic growth, creating new jobs and um, helping us to grow as a nation. And a lot of the ways that we do that is actually we invest in technologies, but we also invest in people as well. So an important part of that journey is actually supporting our innovative scientists to actually be able to go on this journey with us, but particularly nurturing the emerging young talent like yourselves that will form out and become our innovators um, of the future. So I'll give you a few examples of some of the cool stuff that's bubbling around the country at the moment. Um, this is Andrew Kratichek, um, who is a researcher at Plant and Food Research here in Auckland. And uh, he's um, designing some really cool sensor technologies at the moment across a range of applications um, that use the, um, the, the odorant receptors that insects use to detect um, chemicals in the environment. This is uh, Carla Melandandri uh, from the University of Otago. And Carla has um, developed a suite of novel um, uh, silver nanotechnology, uh, nan nanoparticle technologies. Uh, that she's uh, using to treat and prevent um, various dental diseases. And she's already got one of her products licensed to a major international company. And uh, this is uh, Nigel Slaughter, who is the CEO of a company called Ligar Polymers, uh, which is a spin-out company out of uh, University of Waikato and Wintech. And uh, what I love about uh, Ligar is uh, their scientists have um, cracked the code to scale up um, what we call molecularly imprinted polymers, or MIPS, to the point where they can be used on industrial scale. And that is a platform technology is amazing, is that we could be um, essentially dialing up any polymer that we want to extract any molecule we want out of a liquid or solution. So everything from chromium and tannery waste all the way through to high value compounds from, uh, from natural extracts. So that's a really exciting platform opportunity for New Zealand that's bubbling away at the moment. And I suppose you guys, for a lot of you perhaps that are kind of, you know, under Going, undergoing your studies at the moment and thinking about what to do next. I really hope that um, many of you will sort of take the opportunity to, to stay in research and become the next generation of cutting edge scientists and developing the new knowledge that will form the basis of what I've talked about. And there would be kind of three things I would say that I would challenge you to do differently. Um, and the first thing is let's break down some of our ivory towers. As a scientific community, we're very good at kind of breaking ourselves into silos, and I'm a chemist or a biologist or a physicist. A lot of the cutting edge innovation that's going to kind of drive innovation in the future is going to come at the interfaces of disciplines. So not just within science, but outside of science as well. So we really need to break down some of those barriers. Go out and talk to your end users. So by going out and talking to the people that can ultimately benefit from your research, um, A, you're going to have more chance of getting funded. Um, but B, you can actually kind of really have some amazing conversation that can really enrich the research questions that you're asking in the first place and that can really kind of build up your research programs. And the third thing I would say on that front is plan for knowledge transfer. So one of the stark realities we have as a scientific community at the moment is that a vast number of papers, an increasing number, um, are never ever cited by anyone or any, perhaps only their authors. And so we've got a bit of a challenge as a scientific community to make sure that the science that we are created is being used in a way um, where it can we get, get out to the end user. For those of you that are um, taking on a different path, great opportunity um, to kind of really tap into some of those amazing companies out around New Zealand. I mean, there are so many companies out there that really need your science and your expertise. So I really kind of challenge you to go out and find those companies. And particularly, um, don't be sort of too driven by what's available on like job websites if you're looking for jobs. Go and find the companies that really inspire you that are doing something different and, and find the people in those companies that you can build relationships with. Because if you've got that passion for what they're doing, that will create opportunities in itself. And don't forget that the good news is through your scientific training you've already got um, a lot of the, the main skills that a lot of employers are looking for. Um, it's no hidden secret that um, if you get a PhD on in any scientific discipline, you've actually got some of the skills that are in most high demand across the economy. 
And um, I would certainly say that you, you don't necessarily need uh, an MBA uh, to, um, to, to be successful in, in the business world or to add value. And on that final note, don't forget that not all scientists wear white coats, and I'll leave it to some of New Zealand's leading innovators to have the final word. It's really the most wonderful feeling in the world, I think. It is a privilege. I really enjoy it. Innovation is the best part of my job. Oh, it's a passion of mine. Yeah, oh, that's hugely exciting. What I didn't realise is just how intoxicating it would be to actually design something for people. You can work for a long time in science. You can never really understand why a company hasn't taken what you think is your most marvellous research possible. It's often really difficult to say what can we do with this? How can we take this innovation to market? But when you go and work in the company, it's complicated running a business. So when we look at any commercial potential, we look at the science and we also look at the person. That quality of a person. We need more scientists like that. On their own initiative. But I think it's actually the direction of the future for universities. It's changed out the way we think about teaching to not only produce world-class scientists, but world-class entrepreneurial scientists. We're in the world of discovery. If I make something, I want someone to use it. Um, but making significant discoveries. Then commercialization was the next natural Step. Engaging with um, businesses helped us uh, shape up how we might partner with industry. It's been a very exciting journey and we've learned a huge amount. Actually come up with something that's useful. In terms of take up and manufacture. To take a risk and try to do something commercial with big commercial impact. Making sure that we have something that they really want. Developing products that improve people's quality of life uh, worldwide. To do that successfully you've got to be a listener and a communicator. To be able to bring all the different parties together. The ingredients of a good commercial relationship. I think New Zealand is a, is a country that has a multidisciplinary by our very nature. One thing which is very important for New Zealand's economic success is to have impact out of research based on what we know, not just on what we grow. Having a high technology, you know, high innovation product. To really get New Zealand innovations out worldwide. It needs to be global in order to be viable. There are no guarantees, absolutely no guarantees, but... I think no one uh, knew how closely we would interact with global industries worldwide. You know, just from New Zealand the other end of the world. So to have something that changes the operational practice of an industry is very rewarding.